Hello, everyone. Hey, friends. It's good to be with you back in the theater. So good to be back in the space with you. Welcome, everyone, to our May 25th panel and our culminating event for AAPI Heritage Month, um, celebrating activism, leadership, arts funding, and advocacy. My name is Njeme Russell Kamara, and I am the associate. Thank you. I am the Associate Director of Engagement here at Milwaukee Repertory Theater, and I'm also a member of Milwaukee Reps Q, Champions Uniting Experiences. For everyone at home and across the country, welcome to tonight's dialogue, where again, our focus is on the intersectionality between AAPI representation in the arts, legislation, and funding with four phenomenal Milwaukee area leaders. Without further ado, I want to welcome our guest moderator tonight, Mac Antigua, who will introduce our panelists for the evening and get us started. Hi, Hi Mac. <laughs> MacArthur Antigua is the Senior Director of Collective Impact for Imagine MKE. In that role, he is charged with overseeing the process that secures the powerful contributions of artists cultural practitioners, grassroots, and grass tops leaders to achieve a four-part agenda for Milwaukee. Number one, improving the markets and systems of support for working artists, growing the vibrancy of art in our city's diverse neighborhoods, advocating for improved public policies for the arts, and increasing public awareness of the excellence across our city's arts and culture ecosystem to change the narrative of our city. He was most recently the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement and Cross-Sector Partnerships at Public Allies, a national nonprofit committed to building a just and equitable society and the diverse leadership to sustain it. In that role, he sustained and accelerated the leadership of 8,000 Public Ally Apprenticeship alumni, as well as adapted the Public Allies Leadership Model for clients such as the Young Nonprofit Professionals Network and America's Service Commissions. So, without further ado, Mac, as our moderator, please take it away for this evening and introducing our panelists. Awesome, thanks so much. All right. I am so excited to sing the Ella Fitzgerald songbook. No, all right, got it. I, I saw it last week, I was like, can I, yeah. So anyways, hi, thanks for having me. And I'm so glad I sent the small version of my bio to you. So thanks for doing that. I'm so excited to introduce this amazing panel uh, tonight. First to my immediate left is Alexa Alfaro, co-founder of the company Meat on the Street with her brother Matthew. The company was founded on the philosophy food is love. They decided to embark on entrepreneurship by representing their culture through cuisine. In 2013, Alexa Alfaro dropped out of engineering school her senior year to pitch a Filipino food truck to her parents. Meat on the street has been. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> wow! Yeah. yeah happy API oh, month. Happy right now, right? hi, auntie. Hi, mom. Yeah. Ooh, that was. I'm so glad I wasn't in that conversation. <laughs> yeah. MOTS has been published in a cooking anthology, the Fili new Filipino kitchen cookbook. Has done national food tours with stops at Google Sunnyvale, California, Lee's Private Dining, New York City, and Kramer Books and Afterwards in Washington, D.C. Meat on the Street has also appeared on NBC News and Serious Eats, where she discussed creating and growing an Asian business in the Midwest. She's also helped raise $30,000 and served over 3,500 meals to local hospital staff with the Feed the Frontlines Hospital Staff MKE campaign in 2020. Alexa was most recently recognized. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to learn how to pause for effect. She's recently <laughs> recognized as a 2021 Milwaukee Business Journal 40 Under 40 inductee and the Madison 365 48 Most Influential Asian American Leader. We're going to get the whole state in the next time. Alexa Alfaro, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having Woo. me. Thank you. All right. Next to Alexa is Kim M. Kyra, who's received her BA in Political Science with a minor in English Literature from the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Thereafter, worked in gender-based policy, refugee issues, and did editorial and report writing for community-based organizations, and worked at a Southeast Asian-focused publishing company. As a Milwaukee-based Malaysian artist and community worker, her interest is in working directly with refugee community-based groups and with organizations that foster an environment for grassroots empowerment and self-determination. Ms. Kyra is a facilitator with the Nurturing Diversity Partners Facilitators Cohort, led by Reggie Jackson and Frank Kaplan. 
As the Linden Sculpture Gardens Community Engagement Specialist, she coordinates the HOME program, which focuses on engagement with refugee community leaders, members, community members, and the Linden's call and response artists. She allies to envision and build a space of leading, coming together, and celebrating refugees. As a, an accomplished visual artist, Kyra has a residency with the Linden called Pulang Balik, I Am Going Home Too, drawing on the sense of home, creating home, and of making sense of the literal and the abstract. In the Malay language, Pulang Balik means to go back and forth or to return. Please meet Kim. <laughs> to Kim's immediate left is David Lee, the CEO of Imagine MKE, an organization that connects within the arts and culture sector and across Milwaukee to drive forward the vision that arts and culture have the power to transform the city and be the catalyst for social, economic, and civic vitality. David brings nearly 20 years of experience in the nonprofit government relations and community affairs to this role. Prior to Imagine MKE, David was the founding executive director of Feeding Wisconsin, where he was the key driving force to launch and grow Wisconsin State Association of Food Banks. David also brings a rich professional performing arts background as to his role as CEO at Imagine MKE. He studied drama and acting at the Ruth Asawa School of the Arts and the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. After attaining his degree in film and drama at Vassar College, David worked in New York and Los Angeles, writing, acting, and directing plays and films. Plays and films, David. <laughs> There's italics on the and, so I wanted to, that's, you, you gotta, you know. Anyway, so David's an alum of Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business's Business for Impact New Strategies program, the Aspen Institute Academy 2.0 for nonprofit leaders, and a little thing called the American Express Independent Sector NGEN Fellows Program. Everybody, it's David Lee. <laughs> By the way, you at home watching, it's, we have this huge crowd, it's like 20,000 people here. It's like, <laughs> it's like Coachella, except it's indoors and with the, anyway. So, but save this for, get to meet Angelita Tenorio, who currently serves as an alderman in his hometown of West Dallas, Wisconsin. He was driven to get involved in Wisconsin politics because of his belief that climate change is the most pressing issue of our time. He's an alumnus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and as the engagement and development manager at Wisconsin Conservation Voters, Angelito works with donors, board members, VIPs, and community members in the Milwaukee area to raise awareness and support for Wisconsin conservation voters' campaigns. At Wisconsin Conservation Voters, his work has been focused on continuing the fight for justice by empowering supporters, advocating for conservation principles, and holding elected officials accountable. He proudly served in the Wisconsin Army National Guard and served as a co-chair of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin's AAPI Caucus. Everybody meet Angelito. <laughs> All right, here we are. <laughs> we did it. Uh, we're happy uh, AAPI month. Thanks for joining us for this conversation. I'm excited uh, because what, it, what, what this month means to me is visibility. Uh, and so uh, much appreciation to the Milwaukee Rep for making this visible and putting this on some amazing stage here at the Quadratic Powerhouse. And I'm excited to have a uh, conversation with you all. Let's get David, to it. David looks like I'm gonna win a Ford Festiva today. He's like, he's like locked in. David's like, locked, well, let's go. I'm ready to go. He's yeah. ready to go. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to win the friends. All right. Yeah, right now, the question. Milwaukee rep is regretting booking me for yeah, this yeah. game right now. I just let's just put the elephant in the room, right? Angelina's like, let's just name it. He's like, we're backstage. Like, let's just name the elephant in the room. All right. So I brought up heritage as a framing oh. element, and I think we want to make it visible. And so let's start actually with Angelito, and then we'll come back down the line. What from your heritage? you bring with you when you uh, lead in your role? Yes, yeah, so something that from a heritage, I'm a proud Filipino American as you, you've shared as part of my story, thank you for that. And something that I really admire about being Filipino American is really the fighting spirit of being Filipino American and the resilience that comes with my heritage. Mm -hmm. And I bring that with me with my work in politics, with my work in government, with my work in, in fighting for the values that I care about, for the issues that really matter to me, and really being a voice for my community. Um, and that's something that's really stuck with me. From an early age, my mom and dad also really instilled the values of giving back, serving others. And that's something that I really hold dearly in my work, both personally and professionally, and something that I carry with me to this day. David? You know, in Chinese culture, there's this, uh, there's this term called li, which is, kind of a, a, the right way to do things. Um, and it's the right way to do things in a whole bunch of different contexts, right? So the way you interact with your parents, the way you interact with colleagues, with 
people in power. Um, and, and I think there's that that is sort of informed my leadership in like trying to always find that right way of like interacting in social settings. Um, and that that can be kind of confusing sometimes, right? Because these are rules that nobody's ever written. Mm -hmm. um, you just know when you don't do it right. Um, and I think that, that that's sort of a, an interesting kind of like way of trying to like, as somebody who's Chinese, right, trying to figure out like how you're supposed to show up in any given context. Kim, how about you? Um, in the Malaysian context, growing up in a multicultural society and being, and being multiracial myself, um, I can speak for it from a more like wider context. I think Malaysians love to be known as having hospitality. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I, I bring into being hospitable, in, not in, in that American or, or necessary English meaning of it, but more of that inviting sense of knowing your neighbor or how, how to treat a guest that comes into your home and, and things like that. Um, I think the other thing is also humor. Um, I, think, I think us Asians have a certain way of, of using humor to diffuse the situation or, or even to say something directly, indirectly. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it's interesting, it's, we have that humor and, and I think the, the last thing that I think about is perseverance. So similar like what you were saying about um, having that fighter mentality is I think a lot of us, um, if we're not indigenous, you know, to here being, being um, Pacific Islander, um, we're indigenous to our native land. And so I think that perseverance of like, I need to keep on going, um, mm. is, mm -hmm. is quite there. Yeah. Mm. Alexa. I don't know, yeah. It's, it's fun going last, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. wow, three good, good yeah, answers. Three good like, answers. like let, let me get, down, Alexa. Right? Let me get it together okay. here. Um, the anchor on this one. You gotta lock it on. Let's land it. I, much like Angelito, I'm also Filipino American. Um, I tell people I'm American Filipino because mm. I identify American first. Mm. That was. Um, I was born in America. I am American. Um, my mom is half white, so or my mom is fully white, so I'm half white. That would be correct for like all of that science, biology stuff. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> so what do I lead with from my heritage? First and foremost, the most obvious is going to be like food cuisine, right? It's a big part of what we do. It's the product. Um, what people don't, I think, understand about the food aspect is that we actually take it a layer deeper when we do like not only leading but building like a conscious company, building an environment where staff members of all backgrounds and identifying pronoun, whatever it may be, you can walk in there and there's a space for you to be and be comfortable and it can be you that day. So it really comes down to creating like a little bit of like a family within your like work environment, which is weird because it's like, oh, don't get too close to your coworkers or like don't share too much. But like when you work in food and when you work in hospitality and when you work for a small family owned business, like that goes out the window. We break all those rules. We want you to become family. We want you to invest. Um, in the company and in the culture and in the cuisine and find your own, like what motivates you to want to represent us and to re represent us in a way that's meaningful. Um, so for me, it really comes down to like food is love and where was I taught that? That's like family for mm -hmm. me. So like that's really what I try to lead with is making people feel comfortable, making them feel heard, empathizing, still being able to get my point across too, even if it's not like a conversation that's maybe as comfortable, but still making sure that person knows that like I respect them and feel equal to them in that moment. Mm -hmm. So you, you all lead in your roles and in some ways, you know, when I, some of you know a little bit more than others, but you, you almost come fully formed because I was like, obviously that's what you're supposed to do. Like what you're doing now is what you're supposed to do. That probably wasn't the case as you were coming up, right? Like I don't know what I'm gonna do. Or possibly depending on the house you came from, there was a certain sort of choices you were allowed, you know, you probably will do these things. So I'm, I'm wondering, so was there anything from your formative years that might have foreshadowed how you're holding leadership now? Um, I'll start with Kim and I'll, I'll work my way. They're like, how, how's Matt going? I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, like, uh. uh Kim, what about you? Was there anything in your formatives that, that sort of suggested that, that you were going to, you know, work with the Linden and, and create these <laughs> dynamic public spaces that were just incredibly inviting or, or think about how you're looking at, you know, cross-cultural uh, integration? Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting question because I think a lot of us still don't know what we're doing and still trying to figure yes. it out. Um, and, and, when you and say it's me, disgraceful, when I say it, it's a cry for help. <laughs> <laughs> you say it your way, and I'm not going to say mine out loud. I'm just going to keep it bubbling underneath the surface. Right. But, go ahead, go ahead. but um, I, I think growing up in, in Malaysia and probably being the newest transplant here, 
uh, in terms of family history. Um, but growing up in Malaysia, we it, it was always geared towards the sciences in school, if we're talking about formative years, but we're, we're always geared to the science. So if you're interested in the arts or anything to do remotely with the arts, go, go into the sciences mm -hmm. first. You know, do the serious stuff first, the hard science <laughs> first, and then later you can do all your fun stuff or do it as a hobby, right? So. Mm -hmm. So I think There's a lot, a lot of, of nodding us, on the stage right now, <laughs> <laughs> calling up some impressed memories. So keep going. Keep going. So I, I think a lot of us stumbled, stumbled here and stumbled there, I, and I was definitely one of them. Um, but what I, I, I had from a young age was just being, being around people, um, being multicultural, but also that environment that I grew up in was a city island, and my mom was from another, uh, another island. Um, just growing up and having that interaction. So it wasn't one single event, but for some of us, it's that stumbling upon this and stumbling upon that and then figuring out how all these things gel together. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. David, how about you? Um, you know, it, it's a weird thing to be on a panel that your colleague moderates because it feels like he's going to check your answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm screening all around. Right yeah. And I have another channel open on another thing. I, I know, I'm on, like, on the team so, every point you make. <laughs> So in, uh, in my high school AP history class, I had the, uh, the uh, I was a, uh, we had a mock trial of James Polk uh, for the, uh, causing the Mexican-American War. And I was the prosecuting attorney, right? This is a mock trial that this AP history class had always done. Um, and I was a prosecuting attorney uh, to, to try James Polk. And um, I was the only person in the history that up until that point that got a conviction. Um, and there was a, uh, the judge, the person who played the judge, um, who was not the teacher, uh, sort of came to me afterwards and, was, and he gave me this really interesting feedback in the yearbook that year. He said, I've never met somebody who could be so strident and so badgering and yet be functional. <laughs> right? And yet, he wrote that like, in your yearbook? Yeah. That, yeah. Was, his, that was his yearbook? Yeah. Not like, stay yeah. cool, see the pool. That's right. Like, it was like, That's right. All right. Uh, that was that was his that was his memory of me, right? And I, I think as 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 somebody strident who's, yet functional, strident yet functional, and actually like get a point across, right? Yeah. Um, and I think as I as I've sort of diverted from uh, a performing arts career into nonprofit leadership and government relations and yeah. lobbying, uh, that has been like my thing, right? Is like being able to like tell a story, being able to like um, stick to talking points. And to drive points home while not making enemies, um, and I think that has been like the uh, or not not making not making too much trouble with anybody on either side, right? Because you you know you you could be on either side of an issue. So I think that's sort of the, the formative story of like how like you, one can be potentially strident and <laughs> and uh, and and, uh, and yet also functional. Also a nice flex for the San Francisco public school system that's right. as well, because that's a really interesting <laughs> cur curriculum. Of like, <laughs> I'll, I'll break out that James Polk story at the next party, man. Yeah, I integrated it, James Polk. Angelito. Yeah, so a story that really sticks with me, yeah, thinking about my formative years. Um, so I was born in Milwaukee. I lived, my family and I, we lived in an apartment in Greenfield. And then my family, we were able to afford Mom and dad were able to afford to buy their first home in West Dallas. And I remember one time, my mom's in the audience tonight, so. Yeah. Um, but I remember my mom and I were walking around our neighborhood where we just moved in West Dallas, and we ran into a neighbor, and it was a kind older gentleman uh, welcoming us to the neighborhood, and classic asking a little kid, I was really young at the time, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember like thinking to myself, like, and a part of it is stuff that my mom and dad also instilled in me. I wanted to become a doctor. Oh, um, yeah. and, and I think that's pretty classic for like API parents. So like, <laughs> when, you, when you see success, you, you look at medicine and becoming a doctor. Um, and I remember saying that to the gentleman. And then he, he like looked, at, looked, looked at me and said, like, um, a doctor, that, that sounds good. But you know what? We have a lot of good doctors in the world. What we need are good government officials, good public leaders. Mm. And I, I remember that sitting with me. Whoa. And it was kind of profound, but I remember walking away like, he doesn't know anything. I'm going to go to med school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's something that stuck with me. Um, and I, like, over like, the past decade, I, I did my undergrad at Madison. I'm proud Badger. Um, I did try out with biology and started off as pre-med. 
oh my God. But after taking chemistry and calculus, ooh, felt like I ran into a brick wall. <laughs> but I switched gears to, to political science, got involved in College Democrats, student government, I entered the Capitol, and I, and I really felt like this is my vocation. Wow. This is what, the way I could give back to the world um, by getting involved in politics and government. And I think especially for API folks where we don't often see API people represented in government mm -hmm. and in politics, I was like, I'm gonna take a leap of faith and get involved. And that's kind of what wow. led me to where I am today. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, first of all, I'm so glad your mom's here. I like that your mom has her own video. <laughs> She's like, I don't trust this media. <laughs> <laughs> so respect, mom, let me do the same thing if she was here. Second part, that is a heck of a driveway conversation. You know, yeah. like, I think we need more government officials. It's like, all right then, can I have my ball back? <laughs> so, no, but, but, but he was very impressive. He saw something in you. That's awesome. Yeah, my, my neighbors just told me to get off their lawn. So, that's awesome. Uh, thanks for sharing that lovely story. Um, and Alex, I'll, I'll come back to you. For you, what was there anything from your foreshadow? I imagine growing up, food is love. Food is love, man. There's something there that, that signaled it, or maybe something that mm -hmm. didn't signal it. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, if you would have, at like 16, been like, hey, you're going to open up a food truck and you're going to be like really happy, I would have been like, yeah, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been like, yeah, I don't care. That is not what I'm doing with my life. Um, I what was it? What was it at 16? At 16, I just wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to make a lot of money and I wanted a high powered like position. Like that's what I wanted. I just wanted to be the boss, right? I'm an older sibling, I'm the eldest by five and seven years. So like kind of already defined role. Um, and then I was raised in a household that was very progressive. I didn't understand that at the time, but like my parents' voices were equal. My, my voice was equal to my brother's always. I didn't know like outside of that, like it was a thing until I like got into college. I'm like, oh, this is weird because I'm female. That's odd. I just, I did not make that connection very, for many years. Um, Food is obviously huge. Like we were the foodie household. Like my dad would have like fish heads to make stock. Like it's really good. It's everyone's nodding their heads. Super common. <laughs> Your Caucasian friends in elementary school when they see a fish head are like, "Yo, Alexis got weird stuff in her fridge." Right? And I'm like, "Dad, like come on, like don't do this to me." And it's like, you know, you go out and you you, you eat chicken wings like you know with non-ethnic people. They're not gonna break open the bone and suck the marrow. It's like a real normal thing for us to do. And my dad's like, "There's nutrients." I'm like, "Please stop, right?" Like begging him to like, like come on. yeah, it's just like. <laughs> Me, like, right? Dad, I don't care if we do this at home, you and I, but like when I have friends here, like they're gonna say something and like I'm mortified. So it was like this weird line always of like straddling, like being cool and not being too ethnic, but like also loving the food so much that I didn't care. It always started with food. Um, and then like as time went on at my high school graduation, I wanted to roast a pig. I was like, Dad, we got to roast a pig for my high school graduation. Mm -hmm. Super normal in Filipino culture. I love picking the pig skin off as it's nice mm -hmm. and crispy yeah. and crackling. Like, that is my favorite. I want a crispy, grilled, salted, acidic. Like, I love it, right? It's like so good. So my mom is like, absolutely not. My Italian German mother is like, we are not roasting a pig. And I was like, well, then you're not gonna have a high school graduation. So our party, we're gonna roast a pig. And then I had a pig roast and everyone loved it. And I had all this Filipino food and it was just like, those moments to me, like getting to share that level of like love and like family aspect for us, like throughout so many years of my life. I mean, I should have known food was going to be a part of it. I did not think so. I was never doing food. I was never going to do food, mm. but it just kind of happened to be. But did you bury that pig in the ground? Did no, we it? ate it all. No, no, like when you cook it. Oh, you cook it. I was like, <laughs> no, we didn't bury it. We ate it. I know, I don't no, want, I'm not boring. Yeah. I, I, want, I, want to, I was like, how we made that pig? We, we, so we now have the roaster where you flatten it and you put the charcoals on okay. top and you cook it from the like a box style yeah, cooking. Box I think style. that's more Chinese traditional, yeah. but. At my high school graduation, no, we put stakes in the ground and we did pit and it's fun. Yeah, it was like traditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Good. Please tell me there's a pig backstage. <laughs> All right. So after this is over, I hope so. let's go. Let's go to your truck. Um, so the, the thing, the thread that, that keeps weaving throughout these stories is this notion of I think uh, being able to be seen. And mm -hmm. definitely, he spoke to it more. You know, if I if I may, you know, what what makes this really powerful story for me is that I remember when I was in college, uh, I wanted to be a theater major. Northwestern. I, have to, I got flex at school because that's a pretty good theater school. And the way they did it back in the 90s, you had to stand in line at the hall and declare your major. And the theater line lawn was like long, right? So I remember being in line, and it gave me a lot of time to think. And I said to myself, there are no Filipino Hamlets. What am I doing here? And 
and that line got smaller. And by the time I got to the front of my line, I jumped to communication studies because they didn't have math requirements, and I didn't believe I could be a theater major. I didn't never saw one. Yeah. Now, granted, throughout my career in college, I'd, I'd take an acting class, I'd take an ethnography class about, you know, performative techniques and studying cultures and all these things. It was always there. I joined an improv group. I'd later do improv at IO Theater after that. But I remember, like, I didn't have people that looked like me that I could trust to go stay in that line and, and do it. Now, granted, some may say, well, kid, you didn't have the goods for theater. Probably true. <laughs> you got to have some quotes, but I get it. But I wish I didn't ice myself out, and part of that is the visibility. And so I sort of lay that as a story for you all. What does it mean for, for folks like you to be in these vis you know, visible leadership roles in your different fields and being able to advocate for change? I mean, is it something you're not thinking about? Is it something, you know, how present for you besides the month of May? You know, when you're <laughs> it, you get a month. So uh, I'll start with you, Alexis. I've had you hit last for a little. How about you? Oh, does man. It, can, yeah, how about for you? Does it, does it you know, does it sit with you? How yeah. It um, community work, people are important to me, even people I don't like and I may disagree with. Like, I think beings and being equal beings is extremely important and a message that we need to continue to talk about. Um, I was not ever planning on doing community work. I never wanted to get up and advocate for others. I really just wanted to stick in my lane, look at my numbers, crunch my books, and you know have a lot of food trucks and brick and mortars everywhere. Um, obviously, as I've gotten older and being raised in a household um, where my parents did teach us that everyone was equal to you, then forced me to be like, I can't sit here and rep culture through cuisine and not talk about all the different aspects that like our culture is going through, our community is going through within our community in Milwaukee, across the country, because we've been lucky enough to make connections. Um, so it was something that I kind of got pulled into that I wasn't expecting. And why I do it and like why I think it's important is because I know that I get to stand here on this stage and I get to stand here with a personal bank account, a driving license, I get to vote, I get to say no, a guy can't come up here and tell me what to do. I know that in other places of the world at this present moment, people don't have that. And therefore I am lucky and I am blessed and I am privileged and that fuels me to go even harder and to go even further for those who will come after me to keep pushing it so I, we can be able to do all these things and it be normalized. That is why I do community work. That is why I speak and say things and I get it wrong. And But it is why I use my voice because I think it's extremely important. Thank you. That's, um, that's an interesting question to be <laughs> visible. Um, yeah. and, and interesting because, again, being the, the newest transplant here, um, I think about like most of my years, my adult years actually, uh, growing up in Malaysia and working there, my early career there, and then continuing here. Um, back home, everyone is Asian. Yeah. <laughs> most of us are mm -hmm. Asian. So when you come here, it is not a day that you think about your ethnicity. Yeah. Um, and in that, there are some refreshing um, feelings about that. At the same time, you know that being a leader in community work, um, it, you're, you're not here for, for just that visibility, but, and this is just the, 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 the surface and the, the after effect of actually doing all of the work on the ground mm -hmm. and, and all the grassroots work. And, and that's it, like being that visible, um, um, person in, in community engagement at the Linden, it's so that I can step back and others can come forward. Um, and that's my goal, so that tomorrow the rep will call somebody else and not me. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David? You know, I, I'm reminded of um, the, the, the Madison list of, uh, the list from Madison of, of all the influential Asians, right, in Wisconsin that Alexa made. Math sent me the, the, the list when it came out and said, you're not on it. Let's burn this town. Let's burn <laughs> Madison down. Let's burn it. And, and I, I honestly had this really weird feeling of like, you know, do I want it? I don't know. I think I do. It's, it was just this weird feeling, right, that, that like a couple months later when, when um, again, I'm going to say it, it's going to make me feel a little weird, but like, you know, we... I was on the, uh, the notable minority executives list, right? And that gave me like really awkward feelings um, because there's this sense of being seen and there's a sense of like, do you want it? Should it be a minority executives list? Should it be, you know, like, why isn't it just, that's what my dad said to me, right? I sent, I sent him the link. He's like, you should be on the regular CEO's best list. And, <laughs> 
Thanks, I was like, Dad. thanks, Dad. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think that, that that's part of the reason why uh, for us to be in these roles is so important, right? It, it, to, 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 my, um, to the points that, that were said before me, like it normalizes it. And when you look at um, Asian leadership of nonprofits or just uh, Fortune 500 companies, right? East Asian, particularly CEOs, there's a tiny number of us. Um, and, um, and I think as more and more uh, folks ascend or, or break that barrier, right? It just makes it more and more normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think about when it comes to visibility in the API community, it also kind of takes me back to when I was younger. Because like, a lot of times there are these outside pressures that like, make you want to assimilate and kind of like, mm -hmm. blend in mm -hmm. and like, be unseen, be quiet, be, be submissive or complacent, and just like, not to make any noise. Um, but I think what I've really realized over these past few years as I've gotten more involved in, in politics and government is that like, I'm gonna be who I am and I am unapologetically Filipino American. This is a big part of my identity and I think it's really important that I talk about my background, my race and my Filipino American identity because like, kind of like what Alexa was talking about, like I stand on the shoulders of so many people who came before me, mm -hmm. right? And that, that includes my, my mom and dad who, who made the journey across the sea, coming to a land where they didn't know anyone, um, and so many ancestors before them. Um, and and it's, it's really hard um, being the first and being the only, um, especially in politics and government. When I was elected to the Common Council, I was the first person of color elected, the first Asian American elected in the city of West Dallas. And that comes, of course, it's historic um, and incredible, but it's also so frustrating too and disappointing. Like it took till 2020, 2021 for us to elect our first person of color, first API leadership in the city of West Dallas. Um, and it comes with a lot of burden and a lot of responsibility as well. Like I, I think about a quote that our Vice President Harris, our first API uh, Vice President here in the US, um, she always says that the first but not the last. Mm -hmm. And to me that really resonates with me making sure that in my work in politics and in my work as an API elected official, doing what I can to make it easier for the next person that decides to run for office, and specifically for the next API person that comes along and decides to uh, run for office. And in, in my work trying to do what I can to break down these barriers, because there's so many barriers when it comes to running for office. Like, for myself, like I, I don't come from money. <laughs> um, I, I come from an immigrant family. Um, and unfortunately in politics, it takes a lot of money and resources in order to get your name out there or to become electable, as people put it. Um, so I try to do what I can in order to make it easier for the next people that come along and breaking down barriers and providing resources for other folks of color, other API folks who are interested in getting involved in politics and government. There's no doubt with the people on this stage is that your uh, individual fortitude and, and determination has helped carve a path for you to get to this point. And, and both uh, Angelito and others have acknowledged you, you're not alone. You stand on, this, on the shoulders of those who came before you. But I also want to pivot to uh, we're all not in a vacuum. We interact with systems and laws mm -hmm. and <laughs> streams of funding and, and power, right? And so I'm curious of moving beyond an individual conversation, but what, how, how in what way can our system uh, be adjusted, could be funding or um, laws or other ways, so that um, visibility, opportunity for visibility is a little more equitable. Let's get down to brass tacks, baby. We're half hour into this. Uh, let's be you, like tell me the story. Now let's get into it. Tell us a new story of what would it take so that uh, a future version of me wouldn't be like, well, I, I don't see myself, I don't want to do that. Is there a role for you know, what are the ways of policies or, or maybe some promising examples you've seen in other parts of the country that Milwaukee might want to emulate or our state might want to emulate in terms of uh, increasing leadership opportunities for artists of color in the art field or beyond, you know, in our culture and, and politics. I'm not going to call anybody's name. I know that's a big, it's a big entree. If, you, if somebody could take the first bite, have at it. Little does, uh, little do you know, this is like a lobby meeting, right? We're in actually. <laughs> about We're going to start in West Dallas. That's right. We're going to start in move. So, um, so, so I, I'll start, right? I think 
Um, insofar as uh, increasing public funding for the arts is absolutely important, right? Because when you, for those of you who may not know, uh, Wisconsin ranks last in the nation in public funding for the arts. Uh, Milwaukee, as uh, a city and county, also rank relatively low in comparison to cities of relative size. Um, and that really limits the ability for the public sector to be able to invest uh, equitable funding, right, in, in arts and culture institutions. And when you look at the possibility, right, when you look at the fact that um, the county has, in, has made a public goal of making Milwaukee County the, the most uh, healthy county in Wisconsin, when you think of the equity and inclusion goals of the city, we all know that the arts is the way to do that, right, because it creates um, a, an entryway uh, to understand other people's stories. It creates a way to, to create inclusivity. Um, and so um, I think the way we got to do that, right, is, is to really get after some of that American Rescue Plan Act dollars that, that are coming through um, uh, the entire city right now, right? Uh, we at Imagine uh, believe that at least 2% ought to go into the arts and culture sector to ensure that we are able to drive more uh, equitable funding in the arts, include more folks, and to and to create a more equitable and to create a more equitable and healthy Milwaukee for all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the stump speech, by the way. Get used to that because we're just gonna keep hammering that bad boy. <laughs> How about you, for you, Alexa, Kim? What what, do you, what are you hoping to see? What, what could change systemically or possibly? Um, Speaking as an artist myself yeah. and then working in the arts too, I think that the more we can put in money into the hands of artists directly, the better. Yeah. Um, in that, that trickle down effect when it comes to policy and legislation, you know, how does it get into the hands of the artists who are actually the ones creating the art? Because um, we know that artists don't work nine to five, they, they work all the time. Um, so I, I, for me, I, I look at funding the arts in, in terms of that perspective. and. That said, when it comes to funding specific fields or programs, art is something to to your point too. It it, it bleeds into different fields and, and arenas as well. Uh, art is not just something that, that gives us meaning and critique um, in, in what's happening in world affairs and in in, in the local um, areas, but it's also something that creates well-being. Um, and for, personally, I think it increases longevity. So we're looking at it not just from the art field, but also the, the health and well-being field. And Lido. Yeah, so for me, what it really comes down to is like who we have in these decision-making decision -making positions, right? Um, we need people who believe that arts is a priority. Because like truly arts, the arts are an expression of who we are, and artists have been on the front lines when it comes to social justice and social activism. And, and the only way we can get more funding for the arts, public funding from the state level and from the federal government is that we have elected leaders who represent our values and who represent our priorities as well. And I've briefly talked about this already because like right now, I, do, I truly feel like that our elected leaders, Congress and the state legislature are so far removed from the lived experience of artists and API folks day to day. Like I, in the US Senate, like majority of people are millionaires. Um, so why would they care about the arts if they're living in their yachts and mm -hmm. expensive homes, right? So that's why it truly comes down to like what we can do to like totally change the system when it comes to like supporting and electing leaders who represent our values and who represent our priorities as well. Um, I, I think that's, that's, that's how we change the game. Mm. Alexa. Um, obviously food is art, so I mm -hmm. see it in that connection. Yep. Um, being an entrepreneur some days is much like being an artist, I feel like. Mm -hmm. There's lots of struggle and darkness in there, and not a lot of paid <laughs> money going in. Um, <laughs> We got lucky in that our business got a ton of state funding, um, especially early on, and it made sense for us. So I can't speak anything to that. One interesting stat that was not one, but one of the interesting things we recently found out is that 
Oh, a couple years ago, they released a statistic that says 60, 67, two thirds of females will have worked in the food and beverage industry at one point in time. And about a third of those, their first job is in the food and beverage industry. Mm -hmm. Now I have three millennials that walk into my kitchen. One of them walks in and is like, oh, I'm really happy working here because you don't send me home crying every night. I like, don't ever work a job that sends you home crying every night. Like you as an employee have rights. Fine, you're 16, you don't know, we'll educate you. A couple months later, another one walks in. Oh, I'm so happy there's no like creepy cooks in here. Yeah, you should have to, yeah, yes, as a 16-year-old female, you should get a work environment in which you are not sexually harassed. Let's talk about that next. All right, right? Third, last one walks in and she goes, oh, there's no drama here. I'm like, no, you're, you're 16 and I'm, I'm 31 turning 32 and other people we employ are, have more maturity and no, they should not be gossiping about you. That's weird. We don't do that here. That's mm -hmm. not what we do with our coworkers. So my question is when we look at specifically food and beverage industry and I look at our managers and my chef friends and all the owners, I'm like, what kind of an environment are you creating? Because this is the, this is these, a third of them, this is their first job. This mm -hmm. is what we're teaching them, that this is an okay behavior or it's like, I'm like, you guys, you have rights as an employee. Why are we not talking more about this? There needs to be money funneled into that. Um, and on top of it, like food and beverage, we need to funnel more money into one, I think, educating the public into how small our profit margins are and why we want to charge you all more for food and why there's such a great debate in that and all the quality supply chain issues that we have. Um, but I also think we need to talk about like the fact that like we create these environments and are teaching people these like negative learned behaviors of what a work environment should and shouldn't be. Mm. I, I was waiting for the applause line. They, yeah. were, they, were, they were cheering you through that. I knew there was going to be one. So let's, staying on that, you know, I, we, you've all pointed out the, the opportunities for, for things to be different. I, I'm curious to hear, have there been any examples you've witnessed of, of, of hope and possibility, be it around uh, increasing equity, not just for you know, our most marginalized artists to sustain themselves, or for other areas such as uh, making more people feel like they feel included? You know, that they feel like they're part of West Dallas, so they're part of that. What are either uh, examples that, that sustain you or examples that you're really inspired by that go, man, I can't wait till that catches on because that's what I'm seeing in my corner of it that, that's leading to that. So who'd like to, who'd like to give us some hope and possibility? I can give hope after yeah. that. <laughs> after I've taken you down, I'm going to bring you back up, man. Welcome to entrepreneur life, right? <laughs> um, so hope, like one, like, we are a conscious company. It's something we take pride in. Um, most of our staff is female. Most of our staff is people of color. Um, half of them, English is not their first language, and we are a family, and I feel like they want to show up, they want to do well, and they're really proud of the work they do in the work environment. So like one, create it yourself, like right? If I want to see something change, I'm not gonna look at Angelito and be like, yo, you need to change this. I'll be like, okay, what can I immediately change in my circle, right? Hopefully it spills over. Um, that's one of them. And then two, as far as artists, we did a collab with Emma Daisy, who's a uh, muralist in the Milwaukee area. And she did this beautiful, you know, wrap of our truck where we merged like business and art, right? And we did like street eats meet street art type of a thing. Um, and now we get to have ongoing discussions because I'm like, hey, the business side of me wants to generate money, right? And there's all these different revenues now from this one thing you've done for our company in which we can generate revenue. I don't know how you use your art to monetize it, but I would love to have a conversation and I want to make sure we're continuously putting money in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Beyond exposure, beyond this, like if you're doing a good job, if you're benefiting us, we wanna make sure that you're involved in that and directly putting money into the artist. So mm -hmm. that's something we're doing. Thanks, that's, that's exciting. Yeah, I'm super excited. Yeah. What else? What are other Green shoots and things. I can talk a little bit about what's been going on with South, what makes me hopeful. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you're from the Milwaukee or, or even from Wisconsin, you probably have heard like Dirty Stylus. Uh, <laughs> like <says nothing>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and and that's something that we're trying to trying to kind of move away. And I, and I think over the past couple of decades, as my family moved to West House, West House has changed a lot for the better. Mm -hmm. um, and something more recently we've really started exploring and doing is like how can we incorporate art into our city and in, in making our city not just look better but be better actually. Um, so over the past year uh, we get a lot of pushback because there are always folks who are like why well, care about murals when there's a rat problem or if my garbage is getting picked up et cetera, et cetera. But it, I don't know, for me, it's just like, we need to make art a priority, and we can do both, too. <laughs> um, so over the past year, we've 
been working with different uh, building owners and business owners who have like open side walls of their buildings and being like, hey, what if we connected you with an artist, yeah. a local artist or someone from across the country, artists of color. Mm -hmm. And you, if, you, if you drive to downtown West Dallas now, you'll see these beautiful mm -hmm. large murals at the sides of our different businesses and buildings. And, and I think it's really cool. And it and, and really does make our city more vibrant. Um, and it's really encouraging too, to, to see art and incorporating um, in, into that, into our strategic plan as a city, moving forward, we're going to make art a priority, and we're going to we're going to find funds in order to, uh, to pay our artists, um, rather than just relying on people to to do it out of the goodness of their heart. We're going to pay them. We're going to compensate them for the work that they're doing because art is work and deserves to be compensated, um, and that's something that that we really value at West Dallas. It's something we're really working towards. Even though we get a lot of resistance sometimes, we 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 push through that. <laughs> You know, I think there's this, like, um, I want to, like, pull together a couple of these streams, right? Like, the, the fact that artists are essentially entrepreneurs so that Alexa um, brought up, I think that's 100% true, right? I think 60%, nationally, 68% of artists also do have some sort of entrepreneurial side hustle, right? They also, like any other small business owner, need access to capital, mm -hmm. access to markets to sell and, and places and spaces to work. And so, you know, when you think about the, the, the point that Angelita just brought up and also what, what, what Kim had mentioned about like paying artists, right? Like this is labor. It is labor that, 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 that labor of creation, I think we have this, we have this notion somehow that like, um, that because they're doing something they love, they do, that, that's what they're getting paid for. Doing something you love doesn't help pay the bills, right? <laughs> like that, that, that is, that, that's just the fact of it. And so I, I think, you know, as we think about um, how we might be able to fund some of these projects and some of these initiatives, again, this, the, the, these ARPA dollars that are coming in in local aid to lo localities, being able to carve out some of that money in order to, 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 help, um, to help organizations come out of COVID, in order to help pay artists as the laborers that they are in doing all the great work that they do to enliven and, and make our city more thriving and, and more vibrant, I think is absolutely a priority we, we, ought to, we ought to think about, along with the other things such as the streetcar that our mayor wants to do, or you know, a lead abatement, or infrastructure, right? Like these are all one of a piece that we can invest in, right? Like this is not, this shouldn't be zero sum, mm -hmm. that this is all stuff we can do together in order to make um, our city bright coming out of you know an incredibly dark period right uh, th th these last 15 months in COVID. and i think just one last thought right like when you think about how you got through um COVID, through the quarantine you're probably listening to podcasts listening to music watching movies watching online programs brought to you by the milwaukee rep right or picking up guitar or painting right like it was creativity right that got us through and now it's now the bill's coming right now <laughs> now now we have to actually invest right to ensure that as we're restarting and people are coming back out that we have um, the workforce the the vibrant um, uh, city that, that we all deserve 100. Kim interesting points there um, I, I look at it as a, as a two-piece thing one on the artistic side but one on the government and policy side um, what gave me hope was my work back home fresh out of college and was exposed to how state was uh, the state government that I worked with back then, how they manage budgeting. And this was a new experiment that came from the United Nations, mm -hmm. and it's called the Participatory Budgeting Project, or the Gender-Based Budgeting Project. So what it, what it did was trying to marry um, the state, uh, sorry, how, what it was trying to do was trying to marry policy and community. Mm -hmm. once, once you're given money, once the state government is given money, how, how do you allocate those funds? I think that's a huge question that we, 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 we ask because we, at times we just don't know, right? Mm -hmm. the, the public doesn't know. I mean, you have open calls and, and you have um, presentations out there asking people to come and watch and, and find, go to the website to find out how, you know, send in your questions, but it's just not quite enough outreach to reach mm -hmm. the right people to give those quality feedback. Mm -hmm. And so what we did back then was to go grassroots on the ground, to go to our certain neighborhood and, and to find out, okay, uh, what would you like to do in your neighborhood? 
Do you want more playgrounds in your neighborhood? Mm. Uh, do you want a, a community center in your neighborhood? Or do you want a, an, an open space market in your neighborhood? So we actually went there and, and we did all those focus groups and workshops, and workshops including knowing your rights, because sometimes people don't know what their rights are. Um, so I look at that as a policy-based thing. And we also had um, mini election, election periods where we get to uh, vote for what we want, whether it's that market or it's that gym and, and so on. Um, so I look at it in, in that perspective. I think my work with Linden has given me hope uh, mm -hmm. in, in many ways because it was a connection from other artists who were doing the work, other community members who were doing the work. And that hope is to know that um, Asian immigrants who come in here are not, you know, coming here and, and, and like starting to dig, you know, uh, we are standing on the shoulders of a lot of them, many black community workers and, and, and black activists who have done the work actually. So mm -hmm. we're actually working incoherent with them. Um, so, mm. yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun, which means we, we probably gotta leave them wanting more. <laughs> <laughs> So we're actually gonna start wrapping it down. We're, we're gonna do, like, like in true game show fashion, we've got some quicker, I, these are like long essays, beautiful essays, but we have some quick responses. So we're gonna close it out. And so I'm gonna rotate around. So we're gonna start with Alexa. So I'm gonna ask four quick questions. Word or short phrase answers? Think haiku. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna start with Alexa and then go down the line, but then I'm gonna rotate. One song you can't be without right now. Alexa, what is one song you can't be without right now? <laughs> Paradise, Dermot Kennedy. Kim. Bob Marley's Trench House Rock. Hey. Hey. <laughs> uh, Secrets by Gold. Good for you, Olivia Rodrigo. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to name the anxiety that some of these folks had because there was a response from the crowd. There's always like a judge and like, okay, I approve of that. Okay. No, you listen to you. All right, we're going to start with Kim. One word or short phrase. Art is? Intellect. David the ultimate code switcher and translator. Wait, hold on a second. That, that, that's like a, <laughs> that's like a colon and like a semicolon. You said haiku-ish, right? right? Angelina. Liberation. Yeah. Art is creativity. OK, David, you lead off. Community is? Strength. People. Essential. Fostering understanding. All right, and then Angelita, we'll start with you. The last one, leadership is? Servant leadership. Uh, managing emotions. <laughs> Knowing when to follow. Is a practice that anyone can take regardless of position or authority. Awesome. On that, please thank our panel for taking the time. I'll pass it back to you again. And please, Thank our moderator for the night. Thank you all. Thank you all again. Matt, Alexa, Kim, David, Angelito. It's been a pleasure having you in our house at Milwaukee Rep. So thank you for being our guests and for contributing your thoughts, your hearts, your spirits, and your expertise. Um, we are much better and much more full today because of you. So thank you so much. Hopefully you at home are left feeling inspired to take actions in your own ways of leadership, community, and making sure that representation matters. I also want to give a special thank you to Jared and Caitlin and our production team. And to our Q subcommittee members who played a major role in making our celebratory events happen this month. Emily Christofferson, Kara McMullen, Kelly Lapina, Amaris Bates, Amy Dorman, Don Parsons, Melissa Vartanian, Laura Braza, and Tammy Belton Davis. <laughs> Go out, learn, and question, and find the answers inside of impactful dialogues. Most of all, don't let celebrating AAPI Heritage Month, like that of Black History Month, Pride Month, Native American History Month, Women's History Month, and more end at the conclusion of its designated month. The months are there to just rejuvenate our thinking for the, reju for the duration of the year. So with that, thanks for joining our panel discussion and have a wonderful night. Goodbye. Yeah.